Oh, yes. I think if you go to any jihadist group today, they're in their own little bubble, their own little violent world. And they think that they can change the world through violent action. And there's no reasoning that could possibly persuade them otherwise. And this group, the gunpowder plotters, would have had exactly the same mindset. You believe what you want to believe. And once you're set on a course, of course, you're not going to change your view. Hello, and welcome to Bloody Violent History. My name is Tom Ashton, and with my old friend James Jackson, we're going to talk about moments from history that tell us who we are, how we got here, and perhaps where we're heading. And it's often violent and generally quite bloody. I'm here with James Jackson, author of a number of historical thrillers, including his book Treason, which is set in the time of James I, and that date now famous to all school children, the 5th of November, gunpowder, treason and plot. In today's episode, we're going to discuss why this event is the precursor to, and therefore the original, terrorist plot. James, welcome back. It's nice to be here again. So we have kind of made a little list of five headings to explore this subject, and they are gunpowder, terrorism, Robert Sissel, who became Salisbury, Viscount Salisbury, is that? That's right, Earl of, first Earl of Salisbury. First Earl of Salisbury. Punishment that was meted out to the conspirators and then the legacy of the whole business in terms of terrorism. So should we just have a quick start perhaps on gunpowder? Yeah, I mean, what we're talking about here, Tom, is really the weapon of mass destruction of its age. You know, of course, you had rapiers, you had pull weapons, you had all these sorts of weapons. But actually, it's gunpowder that can create the blast, that can create the terrorist effect, the terror effect. And someone like Guy Fawkes, who had been in the Low Countries for a decade, who had seen the Dutch resistance against the Spanish and of course, Guy Fawkes was working with Sir William Stanley, the English regiment, of Catholics who were trying to help the Spanish put down the Dutch revolt and any sort of Dutch government. Guy Fawkes would have seen what the Dutch had done with gunpowder. The Dutch had ships called Hellburners, explosive ships that they sent against Spanish positions, against pontoons and bridges. And Guy Fawkes himself was no stranger to the use of gunpowder. He had been at the Siege of Calais, 1596, he knew how to train guns, he knew, he knew exactly what was what with gunpowder. And that's why they brought him over, the plotters brought him over to join their ranks. He had known them, he had been at uh, the grammar school in York, and he was a clean skin, he was unknown to the authorities. So in modern parlance, as I said, he, he would have been a clean skin. It allowed him to move among the population in London, to live in the precincts of the Palace of Westminster for a year, posing as John Johnson, the manservant of Thomas Percy, one of the key plotters. And so gunpowder was really what they focused on. They had to strike a blow, a large blow, and the only way to catch, capture both the king the lords and his entourage, and hopefully, in their eyes, the offspring of the king, certainly his sons, was to use gunpowder. So a more basic question is, what is gunpowder? A gunpowder, as we all know, is an explosive. It comes from many precursor elements, sulphur, charcoal, saltpetre. In those days, it was a cottage industry, and there was a lot of it about, because don't forget, there was peace on the continent, there was a forthcoming peace deal with Spain, there were no Spanish armadas coming, and yet gunpowder was still being produced. So the authorities were worried that this was widely available, and don't forget that some years before, there was a fowler who let off a gun, discharged his gun close to the royal barge carrying Queen Elizabeth I. So, what did he get done in this guy? Well, he certainly got questioned. <laughs> heavily <laughs> so, questioned. So, heavily questioned. So, yeah. so, there was this worry. And of course, gunpowder had been used in many guises. You know, we've talked about Fort St. Elmo and the Great Siege of Malta of 1565, where bombs were being made out of gunpowder covered in nuts and bolts and yep. wrapped around barrels of gunpowder. So, there was always that concern. And, and I, I, I did see that they did a little experiment with with gunpowder 
at some point in the recent past to see, you know, how powerful these 36 barrels of gunpowder would have been. And they they made up the sort of equivalent, even, even I think, to the extent that they made some of it damp and, and not of top quality. And they were absolutely shocked at the power of when they set it off, how explosive it was. It was no joke at all. You know, it would have destroyed the whole building. Oh, oh more than the building. It would have levelled a kilometre around. So it would have been an immense blast, particularly if in a confined location. You would have had a, a significant effect. It would have vaporised the entire upper classes of England, basically, the, so the ruling class. In terms of a sort of a Second World War bomb landing in London. Is it like a 500-pound bomb? Or, or a... That's difficult to say. It, 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 it Probably greater, actually. Or a landmine? Terms, those, those... Uh, it would have been oh. greater than a landmine. Yes. And it would have Sorry, passed... not a landmine, an air mine, those, or whatever. Uh, that... Yeah, I mean, it would have had an immense destructive capacity. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't high explosive in, in the modern sense, a yeah. plastic explosive, but it's because of the scale of it. And it would have been hidden in firkin barrels, brought across the river from Lambeth. So the authorities were very aware that gunpowder was around and very aware, that of it, obviously, of its destructive potential. They were quite wary of the saltpeter boys who went around collecting the horse piss yeah. from the stables mm. because they were the you know, saltpeter, the nitrates, were, was one of the key precursor elements of gunpowder. And these men went around with their carts, their wagons, would scrape up the sand and the urine from beneath the stable floors and carry them on to the places where gunpowder, the gunpowder mills dotted around. Those gunpowder mills were licensed and they were watched. And we're talking about an era. We're moving on now, really, to talk about the spy networks who would have absolutely kept their ears and eyes mm. open. For well, let's do exactly that. I mean, obviously, you know, so there's a little introduction to gunpowder there. The centre of this talk is really about terrorism, this being a world first in terms of a terrorist event, and linking across to that. Robert Sissel, the great spy master of King James and a man with his finger in every possible... Intelligence pie, yes, every yes. tavern. Although apparently he did a lot on... A lot of his spying was to do with what was written down and not a lot was written down about by between the conspirators. I think what you have to understand is that you're talking about very much a police state of its day. You have a hierarchy, you have, or, or rather a web, you have Robert Cecil at the centre as the spy master, as the Secretary of State. And he had inherited the spy networks of Sir Francis Walsingham, the great spy chief who was there during the time of the Spanish Armada, which we're also talking about in the podcast. But that network included spies in every court in Europe, in the seminaries in, in Rome. So they knew about the priests coming over, the, the names of the priests, the identities, the fake identities of those priests. And was everyone good at doing this? Or... He had a very good network. And apart from these informants, you also had intelligences, what they called in, the intelligence officers and agents who are operating both in England and abroad. This is all MI6. Uh, yeah, and types. MI5 in doing domestic stuff in England. You have pursuivants who are raiding houses. They were the posses of horsemen who used to raid and search the houses. And are they especially, I mean, are they like the religious police? I mean, or were they, they, they pursuing anything? It was really the religious police. They were hunting particularly hunting Jesuits and seminarians. They were hunting Catholic priests. And that's why you have priest holes and hiding places throughout the countryside, particularly in key Catholic areas such as the Midlands. So you have pursuivants raiding these houses. You have searchers who are searching for contraband books, Catholic texts coming in by ship. And all of this is fed to Cecil. He's keeping his eyes open. He's looking for chatter, what today intelligence communities would call chatter. And so you're slowly building up a picture. And sometimes you get it right, sometimes you get false leads and red herrings, but sometimes you chance upon a nugget. You know, there's a, there's a whisper in the wind that says the Catholics are going to try something. Yeah. And if you look at more recently at the sort of intelligence picture that you're trying to build, you know, back here after 9-11, in December 2001, you had the MV Nisha, tramp steamer, coming towards London, heading up the channel, bringing sugar from Mauritius to 
the Tate and Lyle docks in London. Suddenly, there started to be chatter. There started to be a rumour going around. CIA and MI6 got, got hold of it. They started putting two and two together, and they thought, ooh, sugar, that burns very fiercely. I, that is often used today, improvised bombs, because it produces huge heat and energy. Hmm. Now, sugar on its own, no one would take much notice, but there was then a rumour going around saying, ooh, it stopped off at Djibouti, it stopped off in areas that, that had radical Islamic groups. A rumour came out, a snippet of information was passed on saying, actually, uh, this ship also carries a chemical, a pesticide, called methamyl. That can be used as a precursor for nerve agents. And so you put two and two together, you put sugar together, you put this precursor chemical together, this pesticide together, what do you have? You have a vast, dirty nerve agent bomb, potentially. Mm. So in December 2001, as it came up the channel, um, it was raided by up to 70 SBS and SAS guys, fast roping uh, from Chinooks, arriving by ribs and pouring into the vessel. And the crew were pretty shocked. Nothing ever was ever found. But that's the sort of intelligence picture that you're building. You have to be on it and you have to be aware of the sort of threats that might develop, particularly after 9-11 when intelligence communities were really caught off their guard. If you look at the American intelligence community, they were still sort of locked in the Cold War structures. They weren't really looking for asymmetric threats yeah. and the big spectacular. Yes. And was that partly to do with, I mean, it was something to do with that they didn't have much communication between their various agencies in a way that, I mean, Cecil would have had everything feeding into him personally. Whereas in America, they had half a dozen different agencies who might have received one item of, in, of intelligence but not passed it over. Well, that's a very fair point. Uh, Sicil, in a way, was his very own Department of Homeland Security. Yeah. And it does help when you don't have rival agencies all vying for funding and all coming up with their particular way of doing things and their interpretation is one of the reasons that the UK has this joint intelligence committee. It's to, to try and sift through the information and come up with an agenda that the politicians can comprehend and that people can act upon. So when you come across Sissel, he was very much on the lookout for things that might suggest that there was a big plot coming along. And he had already thwarted several plots and he had used those plots to basically bang up his opponents in the Tower of London. Mm. The by plot he had used... Uh, Walter Alley? Uh, yeah, in order to wrap up not just a conspiracy, but also to arrest uh, Sir Walter Raleigh and put him in the Tower. The earlier Essex Rebellion, 1601, he had used to basically corner and then have executed the Earl of Essex. And he did this, of course, with the gunpowder plot. He let it ripen. He wanted to see who was in charge, whether there was a sort of blow-felt figure <laughs> above it all. He would have assumed that there was a nobleman involved, particularly of a plot of this size that was growing and growing and growing. Because this is the thing, whether it's modern terrorism or terrorism then, the more people you have attached to it, the more funding you have to try and get in, the more open you are to penetration. To, the more to, leaky uh, the boat. Absolutely. And, th and this is what happened with the gunpowder plot and with more modern plots and more modern conspiracies. And, and sometimes some people don't listen to, you know, aren't aware, as you know, we've talked about 9-11. You know, if you're looking in the wrong direction or looking for the wrong thing or your intelligence structures are faulty and are geared to a different kind of threat, yes. you're, you're not aware of what is coming. And, and certainly, you know, when I was lecturing on terrorism in the 80s and 90s, I was very aware that people didn't want to hear that terrorists were going to graduate from the traditional bomb, bullet and booby trap. What we were used to from, from Ireland. Well, exactly. And in the end, I wrote Deadheaders, which came out in 1997, because I wanted to give warning that we needed to go, go out and deadhead, literally, terrorist organisations before they could act. And yeah. I had terrorist spectaculars in New York and Paris in the book, because I wanted to show that this was the era of mass terrorism. This was how it was going to be.
I, I suppose, in a way, I was proved right. And that, as we all know, 9-11 was a seminal moment because that is the moment where the world sat up and thought, right, this is a change of, this is a step change in how terrorist organizations are going to act. And in the same way, the gunpowder plot was an absolute step change because not only did they want to use gunpowder and brought in this clean skin, brought in Guy Fawkes to act as the agent of destruction in London, but it went further because what they really wanted to do, and which was the, the really the crux of the whole plot, was the kidnap of Princess Elizabeth, the nine-year-old daughter of James I, who was at Coombe Abbey in Northamptonshire. They had a gang of 100 Catholic horsemen who were going to ride across Dunmore Heath, raid Coombe Abbey, snatch her, marry her off eventually to a Catholic on the continent, and put her on the throne, they thought, as a sort of Catholic stooge. And that was really the key to the whole plot. So, so it was, uh, the, the bit that everyone gets excited about is the blowing up of the Houses of Parliament, but actually, from their point of view, it was a regime change, an idea that they thought they could change the entire regime, England, or at least push it back to, to pre the days in, when, it, when the Catholic faith was, was, Rome had the sort of final say. Correct. And they thought they had a good plan. I mean, it was a pretty desperate plan. But they thought that they'd create the vacuum and then they would, people would say, oh, here we still have the daughter of James I. The Catholics control her. They will have a region to some kind. They'll marry her off. And it will be step change. And they saw themselves as warrior priests, just as modern jihadists see themselves as holy warriors. Yes. And they thought that God was on their side. They thought it was the end of days. And they thought that James was the Antichrist. They were dealing with a king who was terrified of assassination. If you look at his movements during that period, he spent a lot of it out of London hunting, partly because he was terrified of the plague, but partly because he was terrified of assassination. So he spent a lot of time in the saddle on his horse. He wore an armoured doublet because he thought that he would either be stabbed or someone with what was called a pocket dag, a wheel lock pistol, might take a pot shot at him. So he was moving around all the time. He was of a nervous disposition. A very nervous disposition. I mean, if you look at his background, people were being murdered up in Scotland all the time. And if you think what happened to his mother, Mary, Queen of Scots, then you sort of understand why he had that nervous disposition. Yeah. And he, he was no fool. He was no fool. But he was certainly scared. And he was certainly scared of Catholic radicals. And so he, in a sense, clung to Sissel. They didn't have to like each other. Most leaders don't like their spy chiefs, but they have to trust them. They have to rely on them. Yeah. And he knew it was Sissel who brought him down to London, basically put him on the throne. He depended on him. Well, maybe just to go back to the actual plot itself, we could just run through a few of the characters because obviously Guy Fawkes is the is the famous name that everybody knows and remembers. But there were a dozen or so key people involved in the whole business. So if I just give you the names and then we can have a little, you can weave them into the story for me. So, I mean, the first guy is Catesby. Yeah, Robin Catesby was really the de facto head of the whole plot and far more important in a way than Guy Fawkes because Guy Fawkes was the mercenary. He had been brought in as the gunpowder expert. But Catesby was the one who brought the whole plot together and he was related. They were all basically related to each other somehow, in-laws, etc., etc. And, of course, they shared the same faith. Some of them had been involved in the Essex Rebellion. These were violent men. They weren't afraid of taking up arms. They felt that they had been pushed into a corner. Recusancy fines, the fines against Catholics, were going up. Catesby had lost a manor to recusancy fines. A lot of these families were suffering from James's spending. James wanted to raise a lot of money in order to pay for his male favourites and giving them estates. So what better way of raising funds than confiscating them from Catholics? Yes. So these Catholics saw no way out. This diehard group of radicals thought, 
right, we need to rid ourselves of James. And whereas more intelligent or more considered Catholics, such as Father Henry Garnet, chief of the, the Jesuits in the country, were very much cautioning against violent action, saying, look, you know, the king is there by divine right. He is there, he is chosen. And, of course, he is the son of Mary, Queen of Scots, a Catholic. So don't, whatever you do, try and kill him. Yeah. And he actually might come round to way, our way of thinking. They always thought there might be a rapprochement. But, of course, Catesby and his gang uh, thought otherwise. And they had been thinking a long time. I mean, don't forget that they were meeting at the Duck and Drake Tavern in London the year before, the spring before. They had met originally, it's believed, in the gatehouse at Ashby St. Ledger's, Catesby's house. And I've been in that, that gatehouse, in the room upstairs where they first met. And it's very strange when you go to these locations, you feel it through your toes and through your fingers. Yeah. When you stand there and think, this is where they first met. And of course, it's, all, it's where they ended up. Because when the key plotters fled London, they passed that gatehouse on the way to Dunchurch, to the Red Lion Inn, where the horsemen were gathered to kidnap Princess Elizabeth. So it started in that gatehouse and went on from there. And Catesby, so he's the guy in charge. He's the chief fanatic. Then you get Thomas Percy. The sort of, he's, he's the really, chairman. He's the sort of right-hand man, a very violent man. Okay, um, but also a knob, I mean, an aristocrat. Yes, he was second cousin to the... Earl of Northumberland. He had worked up at uh, Annick, the seat of the Northumberlands, and he was known to be violent. He had killed a man, a reaver, who was raiding the lands across the border. You see, again, he wasn't averse to using violence. No. Then you get the adjutant, Thomas Winter, whose brother Robert Winter in Huddington Court, which was a key house in the plot. Uh, then you get the Wright brothers, the two Wright brothers. Yes, Jack and Kit. Jack and Kit, who are great swordsmen, and they were really the enforcers and the muscle, if you like. Yeah. And so this group started expanding. They needed horses, they needed money, so they brought in people like Sir Everard Digby because what they wanted to do was use houses up in Warwickshire, Northamptonshire, that ringed Coombe Abbey as the launch pad for their real plot, which was to kidnap the princess. And if you look at a map of the area... You have all those houses. You have John Grant at his house, Norbrook, just north of Stratford upon Avon. And they're in that area. And that's where they started to collect horses, where they started to collect armour, and where they started to gather the manpower. Do you think, given that they were all kind of hugger mugger together and they managed to convince themselves there was an appetite for this change in the country, whereas, in fact, they were basically speaking to themselves in a way that we've seen even in modern times and politics, that people are utterly convinced, and yet the actual nation has a completely different viewpoint. Oh, yes. I think if you go to any jihadist group today, they're in their own little bubble, their own little violent world, and they think that they can change the world through violent action. There's no reasoning that could possibly persuade them otherwise. This group, the gunpowder plotters, would have had exactly the same mindset. You believe what you want to believe. And once you're set on a course, of course, you're not going to change your view. No. You take a blood oath, you confess, you give it a sort of religious legitimacy. Yes. Then the path is set, and you're not going to jump off it. And yet, and you say these men extremely violent, capable, they fought in wars. But in a way, outside the structures of the army or whatever, they were amateurs. I think so many terrorists today and then are amateurs. They're amateur enthusiasts. And in a way, that is what helps the authorities, that you're not dealing with hugely professional people. You're dealing, certainly today, for example, with a bunch of very low-grade petty criminals quite often. If you look at the underpants bomber or the shoe bomber, they're very low grade. And quite often... Yes, the ones they're almost today, a joke until they until get it they right. Act, until they act. Yeah. And often it's luck. And if they're operating alone, it's even harder to penetrate their plan. 
Whereas the gunpowder plot, because it was growing exponentially in terms of numbers, it was easier to pick up chatter, gossip among the Catholic community. Also, you had snitches, you had informants. Of course, we'll come to the Monteagle letter, which eventually betrayed the gunpowder plot. But I've always thought that Robert Sissel allowed the plot to mature so he could see where it was going. He could present it as a fait accompli to King James and say, this is a whole plot that I have managed to wrap up for you. I'm presenting it to you. What do you think? And so, Robert Sissel, what's his story then? Oh, Sissel was the son of William Burley. He had always been basically groomed for that top spot. He was a hunchback. What, when, his, when Burley died, wasn't he, why wasn't he called Burley? Was he not the eldest or something? He didn't inherit it. He didn't inherit that title, but he became the first Earl of Salisbury. Okay. So he developed his own regime. He wasn't liked. He was never liked by anybody. He was extraordinarily deceitful man. <laughs> he was... But was he a sort of classic bullied at school type oh, individual? Yeah, you're talking about an era in which physical deformity suggested some sort of abnormality in your, your soul. In your soul. Yeah. Uh, and he was a sort of... Hun- he was hunchback, he was club-footed, he was tiny. It absolutely affected him. He was always considered the coldest, most Machiavellian individual that had ever walked the planet, and he was. But he was an amazing operator. Yeah. Unlike Walsingham, who bankrupted himself as spy chief protecting Elizabeth I. Robert Sissel did far from that. He absolutely feathered his own nest. He became richer and richer. He acquired more and more titles. He became, in time, and a few years later, he became Lord Treasurer and Lord Chancellor. He was taking on every single major position of government. Okay, so his motivations weren't just, I must protect James I. It was, you know, this was his career and he was going to jolly well get to the top. Everything was a career move. If he stood at his window at his house in the Strand and looked along the Strand, he was looking at houses of nobles that he had outfoxed, outmaneuvered, had executed or had arrested. So he was clearing out the stable and making it easier for himself. Why didn't anyone take him out? Oh, he was far too powerful for that and far too close to the king. The king completely relied on him. And so when he went to the king eventually with the evidence, the king was absolutely in no position to ignore it. He knew how to flatter the king. He knew how to suggest to the king, look at this, what do you think? And the king would come up with the answer and think he was incredibly clever. And Sissel was a very good courtier. But he was ruthless, yeah. absolutely ruthless. OK, well, let's. you mentioned it a moment ago, but let's get into the unravelling of the plot and the famous letter. Yes, what happened towards the end of October, October 26th, 1605, a letter arrived at the home of Lord Monteagle. Just prior to that, so everything was in place by then, was it? Yeah, everything was in place. You had Guy Fawkes had been living in the precincts of the Palace of Westminster. What had happened was that Thomas Percy had become a gentleman pensioner. He had become a bodyguard of the king, uh, put there by his second cousin, the Earl of Northumberland, for whom he had worked up at Annick Castle. He was supposed to have taken the oath of supremacy. He was supposed to accept the king was ordained by God to be the ruler of England. He hadn't done that. So he avoided that, but he was still shoehorned into position as a gentleman pensioner, which allowed him quite legitimately to get a house in the precincts of the Palace of Westminster. And that's where he installed Guido Fawkes as his manservant, John Johnson. Guy Fawkes was there, and at the same time, Robert Keyes, who was essentially the quartermaster of the plot, was guarding the gunpowder over in Lambeth, in Robin Catesby's London home over in Lambeth. So it was a very short, wary trip in a rowing boat to bring the gunpowder barrel by barrel across to Westminster Steps and lodge it in the undercroft below the House of Lords. And this was all in place and done some months before November? Yes, it was. 
because it was there so long and because it had been stored in Lambeth, they then found that the gunpowder had decayed, so they then had to replace it. It wasn't necessarily smooth going, but by the time of November the 4th, the evening of November the 4th, the gunpowder was there. So that's London sorted out. Mm -hmm. Now, up in Northamptonshire, up around Coombe Abbey, you had the horsemen had gathered, the arms with a posse of about 100, they reckon, had gathered near the Red Lion Inn. And Sir Everard Digby had moved in there for the night. He was going to ride across Dunmore Heath and attack Coombe Abbey and snatch Princess Elizabeth. Now, what happened was that Guy Fawkes was captured. The news got out pretty quickly that things had gone wrong. But there was a commotion, there was a lot of noise, lanterns, up and down the Strand, gossip spread wildly. Of course, you had the people connect to the plot in that area. News got out. So the main ringleaders, like Catesby, fled London. They galloped throughout the early hours of November the 5th up to Rugby, 80 miles they rode. They had positioned horses for this sort of moment yeah. on the route. They got past Ashby St. Ledger's, they went up the road a few miles, found the horsemen, told them all that was lost. It all started falling to pieces very rapidly. The horsemen, of course, disappeared because there was nothing left for them to do. By that stage as well, they didn't know it, but Princess Elizabeth had been moved to Coventry. So Cecil obviously knew there's something... Sorry, we missed the middle bit there between the getting ready for the plot and the unravelling of the plot. The letter. Oh, yes. Well, back to the letter. The Lord Monteagle receives this letter. He takes it to Robert Cecil. Cecil immediately knows and understands, appreciates uh, what it means. He starts hatching his plan. And I've always thought that he knew something was up anyway. He had got a lot of intelligence. He knew that Guido Fawkes was in town. He knew his background. He knew the basics of who might be involved. And as I've said before, some of the diehards involved in the plot had been involved in the Essex Rebellion against Elizabeth I. So they were known names. They were known names. And he would have had his hit list. What he does, he goes to the king and he shows him this letter and you'll read the letter so we'll get an idea of what it says. And here is that letter. The transcript starts, My Lord, out of the love I bear to some of your friends, I have a care of your preservation. And it carries on in rather dated English. This is a simplified transcript. My Lord, out of the love I have for some of your friends, I want to make sure you are safe. Because of this, I would advise you not to attend this sitting of Parliament because God and man have agreed to punish the wickedness of this time. Do not think this is a joke. Go to your estate in the country where you will be safe because although there is no sign of any problem yet, this Parliament will receive a terrible blow and they will not see who it is that hurts them. This advice should not be ignored, as it may do you some good, and it can do you no harm, because the danger will have passed as soon as you have burnt this letter. I hope God grants you the grace to make good use of it, and that he protects you. It talks of an invisible hand, and he says to the king, what could that possibly mean? And the the king goes, ah, you know, with my little grey cells, I discern that this means gunpowder. So I'm not going to go anywhere near the House of Lords for the opening of Parliament. So this is what happens. So Cecil arranges a search party. The first one doesn't find anything. Maybe it was a feint. The second one, of course, stumbles across Guido Fawkes, who's there with matches and a watch, 36 barrels of gunpowder. And so you have that plot wrapped up. You have Guido Fawkes taken to the king for an interview. Guido is then taken to the Tower of London. They start to torture him, to rack him on the 7th of November, by which stage the plotters up north are in full flight. Robin Catesby, of course, has lost the 100 horsemen or so, and he's left with a few desperados, his key right-hand men, 
and they start riding westwards. It's always thought that they were riding for Wales. They raid certain houses, they raid Warwick Castle, trying to get more horses. At the same time, they're trying to incite a revolt, an uprising throughout the country. And, of course, that doesn't transpire. There's no appetite. There's no appetite. And, of course, this is where, and again, it's modern terrorists, quite often because they're in their own little world, they don't understand that there is no popular support for what they're doing. People don't want violence. People don't want an uprising. People want to put bread and food on the table and get on with their lives. When it comes to the gunpowder plotters, the doors are shut in their faces and no one wants to join them. And also people appreciate that they're on the, you know, they're, they'd be backing the losing side by this stage. You're not going to start backing a few bedraggled horsemen in full flight. Yes. The weather is appalling. It's snowing. It's muddy. They're getting no sleep. So not only has Catesby ridden up from London, he then starts leading his desperate gang westwards. They end up at Huddington Court. They spend the night there on the 6th of November. Huddington Court was the home of Robert Winter, one of the plotters, brother of Tom. A priest emerges from the priest hole there and basically gives them last rites. They know they're condemned men. By this stage, there's a hue and cry. Various posses, militia are on their tail. From Northampton, for example, the sheriff from Northampton leads out his men. And again... And this uh, is the equivalent of today's local constabulary. Yes, yes. Uh, The armed divisions. Yes, the armed divisions. And quite a lot of men. I mean, there were 200 men coming from Worcester, for example. Right. So, again, I've always thought that... Sissel was on it from a much earlier stage. The fact that Princess Elizabeth is taken to Coventry and housed in a tower in which her grandmother, Mary Queen of Scots, had been arrested and imprisoned for a while. And so she's there. The plotters are in full flight. They end up at Holbeach House, which is just south of Birmingham. That is the house of Stephen Littleton, ancestor of the jazz trumpet Humphrey Littleton, I might add. Oh, right. And Red Humphrey. I wonder if he was as funny as Humphrey Littleton. Red Stephen. (laughs) He might have lost his sense of humour by this stage. Yeah. So they hold up there. Seven of them are left. Their gunpowder is soaked to the fallen in the River Stour. Again, I've been to this house, and it's amazing that there are still musket ball holes around the front door. It's now an old people's home. But it's a fascinating house because, again, it has priest holes, it has tunnels underneath. So you can really feel the... You can really feel the vibe. You can, yeah. It evokes the spirit of that time. It's not a large manor house. It's pretty modest. But when you climb the steps, the, the few steps to the front door, you know that those are the steps that Catesby and Tom Percy came down back to back with their swords drawn. The wall... It's like Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Absolutely. And the wall behind which the posse from Worcester had arrived at, they were hiding behind it. It's a low wall. It's, it's only about 15, 20 feet from the front door. So they're firing at point-blank range. And a hail of, of musket Hail of musket balls. The night before, on the 7th of November, because the gunpowder was wet, some bright spark had decided to put it in front of the fire to warm out (laughs) but you've got to imagine these guys had no sleep for for nights they were not thinking straight weren't thinking straight they were on the run put it in front of the fire the gunpowder blows up and there's a crack in a beam there in the house today which was probably caused by that 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 blast and of course it's the only gunpowder that actually blew up in the entire time so in a way and i mean how often do we hear even today of you know people terrorists fiddling around with their bombs and blowing themselves well, yeah, up in the whether process. It's, uh, whether it's on the London Underground or elsewhere, it, yeah. it happens all the time. So again... In error, though, as well. Absolutely. So again, you have them putting the gunpowder there. It ends up burning three of them, blinding one of them, John Grant. And they know their time has come. That is it. They have no gunpowder. They're wounded and they're in trouble. And the following morning... Uh, the 8th of November, they decided to charge out. The Wright brothers, Kit and Jack, go out to try and get the horses to see if they can make a dash for it. They're both gunned down. Tom Winter is wounded in the shoulder. And Catesby and Thomas Percy 
draw their swords, come out fighting, come out back to back, and they're killed by a single musket ball. This is an extract from James Jackson's historical thriller Treason, which is based on the events of the gunpowder plot. Tom Wintour was the first to be hit. Unsuccessful in his final drive to gather recruits, he had returned during the night determined to die with his confederates. Now, as he ventured out to reconnoitre, a musket discharged at close range and his right shoulder was instantly shattered. It was late morning on Friday the 8th of November, and a company of 200 Worcestershire militiamen had the house surrounded. Robin Catesby's loyal lieutenant would curse the hour he was not killed outright. From around the low wall framing the front courtyard, volleys of shot opened up, lead tore through leaded panes and splintered wood and threw out clouds of brick dust. A show of force was necessary to break the spirit of resistance. Sir Richard Walsh, High Sheriff, was not tempted to raise his head above the parapet. The response soon came. Jack Wright bounded down the shallow steps, his sword drawn for battle. He did not get far, a musket ball ripping through his chest and bringing him down. Not even the plot's enforcer could withstand the withering point-blank fire. His younger brother was next, Kit running low to draw the guns and test his metal and falling, mortally wounded. The smoke cleared and the guttural moans of dying men sounded weak and plaintive in the air. Another man had decided to make a dash for the stables. Weakened by his burns and bracketed by shot, Sir Ambrose Rockwood limped out in a futile gesture of defiance. He was quickly halted by a round to his thigh. He slumped against a wall, unable to do anything but watch the final events play out. Smoke drifted in the house as curtains caught a light. Catesby, Percy and Wintour gathered in the hall. They seek to flush us out. The leader drew his sword and regarded his two companions. I swear, they will not take me. Percy shivered with the energy of the moment. I stand with you, Robin. And you, Tom? Will you die with us? My sword arm is no help. Wintour pressed a bloodied rag against his wound. No matter. It is a staunch heart and a steady eye that counts. Then you have my company. Catesby looked from one to the other. I could not ask for more. I am glad I meet my end with the bravest and closest of my brothers. We too are blessed, Robin. His face pale, Wintour looked at his leader with devotion. Though God deserts us, we stay loyal to him and are bound by our duty to the cause. Percy saluted with his blade, to the true faith. His friends echoed the words. The trio murmured a last prayer as Catesby turned the lock and swung wide the door. What had begun as discontent and crystallised to direct action would peter to a close at the entrance to this modest house. There was a frozen moment, a pause before the onslaught, a deep intake of breath. Shall we, gentlemen? The three stepped out to martyrdom. A marksman obliged, dropping Catesby and Percy with a single shot as back to back they descended the step. The fight was over. The militia rush in, they start stripping the bodies of anything valuable, including their boots, and those left behind, people like John Grant, Tom Winter, they're arrested, and they're taken back to London, basically got ready for trial. There's no point torturing them. Firstly, you don't torture gentlemen. That was really the unwritten code. It doesn't matter if you put someone like Guy Fawkes... So, yeah, he's not considered a gent. No, no. But the others are, essentially. But and gentlemen also, still get hung, drawn and quartered, do they? Or not? Generally, they just get their heads locked. Oh, no, no, no. They get hung, drawn and quartered for treason. But not only was it considered ungentlemanly to torture them on the whole, but at that stage, Sissel knew what was going on. He had the list of names from Guido Fawkes, who eventually spilt the beans. And you, you can tell the effects of the rack by just looking at his signature the public records yes. office. I mean, it, it ends up flatlining. There were always other tortures. They were always called the, the gentler tortures. What, manacles as well? Uh, uh, manacles, gauntlets, 
What is manacle? You hang people either from gauntlets or from manacles. Right. And, that, that will, and their body weight. Th- th- yeah, that would dislocate their shoulders and put appalling pressure on their bodies So and make it incredibly difficult to breathe. And, of course, there was branding. There, there are all sorts of things, pliers, yeah. the works. And then, of course, having found them guilty and everything else, they had to go through the whole procedure of being hung, drawn and quartered. Yeah, and they were dragged on hurdles and taken to Palace Yard in Westminster. And was that, uh, dragged on hurdles, was that a shameful thing or was that actually a painful thing? Oh, it was a painful thing as well. I mean, it was very rough going. And and quite often, actually, dragging through the streets. They used to do it without hurdles at one stage and people would die on the way. Yes, But, but, I mean, a hurdle, it was the humiliation essentially. They sort of dragged um, their feet first, they're being, having cabbages thrown at them and things like that. Yes, tied to the rear of a horse, essentially, and dragged along. So it was rough going and quite a way to get to the Palace of Westminster. And there they were hanged, drawn and quartered. And Guy Fawkes was taken, he was in a very weakened state. And of course, he took the very wise decision of jumping early and it broke his neck. So he died before he was drawn and quartered. And so lucky, lucky Guy Fawkes. Yes. Uh, Robert, okay, so for the gory, gory listeners amongst our audience, what happens when you're hung, drawn and quartered? Well, you are essentially hanged for a minute, two minutes, so you're barely conscious. I mean, if you had paid the hangman enough or if he was on your side, he would allow you to hang longer. So you would be dead by the time you were cut down and drawn and quartered. If it was a really serious case and you had been told as a hangman, don't allow him to lose consciousness, it would have been about a minute of kicking, struggling, you name it, windmilling. And then you would cut down, you would take him to the block where the executioner wearing an apron would castrate you and disembowel you and pull your intestines out with a stick and throw them on a fire. And all this time you're alive? Yeah, you would have been alive until your heart had been plucked out and also thrown on the fire. So it was all the key areas and very symbolic. You were castrated so you wouldn't have any progeny. Your guts and your heart were taken out. And then, of course, you were quartered. And those quarters would be hanged around the entrances to London, basically. So, Your what, head, uh, so a quarter, which is like a bit of a head an and arm. one ar- yeah, an yeah, arm and a head yeah, and then an yeah, arm and a yeah, torso, part of your torso and one leg and yes, another leg. Yes, it wasn't an exact science. <laughs> 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 and the head would then be stuck on a pike. Yeah, okay. Either yeah. over West, yeah, outside Palace Yard after the beheading, over London Bridge was a favourite, the southern end of, of London Bridge. So people would see what happened to traitors. Sir Walter Raleigh, who did everything he could to distance himself from the gunpowder plot afterwards, I've always thought he would have stood on his walk along the wall from the Bloody Tower of London and seen heads go up over, a range of heads go up over London Bridge, further upstream. So What, and think, is this the next one on there, a spike is going to be mine? Yeah. Uh, Which it eventually it was. Well, funny enough, when he was beheaded, his wife walked around with his head for years in a sack. Uh, Why was she allowed to keep it? Probably just a nice gesture. Just a touch, they uh, said. You she know. used to take it out at dinner parties. <laughs> <laughs> I've still got him with me. Oh. But, of course, he's buried in front of the altar at uh, St Margaret's Church. So uh, whether his head is there St or Margaret's not, I'm not West- quite sure. Where- yeah, St Margaret's Westminster, just next to Westminster Abbey. But, of course, after... Guy Fawkes killed himself after he broke his neck. Robert Keyes, the quartermaster, was next to be hanged. And, of course, he jumped trying to do the same thing. But the rope broke. So he was taken to be drawn and quartered. And he was fully conscious. He escaped the hanging bit, but he went through an appalling and barbarous end. Would have probably delighted the crowd. <laughs> and that is really where the term hangers-on comes from, actually, in, in public hanging, certainly at places like Tyburn. If you paid the hangman enough, you were allowed to come forward and hang on to the feet of the person who is... Your relative or whatever. Yeah. And give, dispatch them before they were taught to to death. Yeah, well, or just help them die more quickly. Yeah. That's where hangers-on having hangers-on is really quite useful <laughs> yes. if you pay them enough. But this this was really a treason execution and there wouldn't have been any of that. And certainly when later, when Father Henry Garnet 
was hand drawn and quartered in the St Paul's, in the grounds of St Paul's. The crowd were very much on his side. He was very dignified, and they absolutely surged forward to hang on to his feet. Okay, so he was probably dead by the time they chopped. He was a very gentle man, and oh, no, by all accounts, he he wasn't in favour of this. Completely against it. The Jesuits were very much against it because they knew there would be a terrible backlash against Catholics yes. in England, and that's what most Catholics wanted to avoid. And they didn't want a yet more rigorous regime against them. You know, they were keeping managing to keep one step ahead, you know, use the priest holes in which to hide. Some of the priests linked to the gunpowder plot, who knew the plotters, managed to smuggle themselves out of England and get abroad safely. And that's what a lot of the Catholic gentlemen, a lot of the recusants who had volunteered to come over from the Low Countries to join in the supposed rebellion they would have also vanished abroad, just slowly filtered, yeah. filtered away. And, of course, it is this thing that the broader the plot, the more people involved, the more likely information is going to seep back, filter back to Robert Sissel. And whether it was from the horsemen, whether it was from Sir Francis Tresham, who was brother-in-law of Lord Monteagle, who was one of the plotters, there is no doubt. The gunpowder, man of, you know, the, yeah, the purchasing of the various ingredients for the gunpowder and so on. There's no doubt that the jigsaw was coming together. So, sort of in summary, Robert Sissel's problem was uh, not so much that he didn't know or, or have suspicions about the plot. It's and this is, happens today as well. It's when to arrest everybody. Yeah, it's it's, problem. it's when to jump, when to strike, yeah. when to strike. In in a way, it was easier to an extent then because there weren't the niceties of human rights and you didn't have to have go through the hoops, jump the hoops of etiquette and decency. You could just put someone on the rack or you Absolutely. could... Or, yes, or, but you, or were still, them. you still had to avoid creating martyrs and things like that, didn't you? I mean, you, you had to sort of get them just before they kill everyone... But at the same time... Yes, you had to let it mature. To, and then to, kill to, them on your own terms yes, rather than yes. let them go up in a ball of... Yes, you flame. had to... And you wanted to get to the stage where you have a pretty comprehensive roundup, And you had to know that there was a mastermind. And I suspect the CISA was a little disappointed that in this case there wasn't a nobleman who was behind the whole thing. Of course he managed to scoop up the Earl of Northumberland, but he got him really... By default, as by an the, association through family, really. through family association, and by the fact that he had allowed him to become a gentleman pensioner, he, he had allowed Thomas Percy to become a gentleman pensioner, and thereby create an environment in which Guy Fawkes could operate in the precincts of the Palace of Westminster, and that didn't do the Earl of Northumberland any good at all. And it's no coincidence that when the Earl of Northumberland was still in prison in sixteen oh seven. It was his younger brother, George Percy, who set out on ships to go to Virginia and start the Jamestown settlement. So it was just a means of getting a member of the family, getting a sibling away from the cesspit of politics in London. No one knew what might happen to the Earl of Northumberland. So it was no bad thing getting a rally away from the scene. So... Percy ended up in Jamestown, ended up heading up Jamestown. So it's amazing how these plots had sort of knock-on effects. Yes. And in the same way that so many of the people who were involved in plots ended up fleeing to America to get out of the way. So whether it was America or whether it was the The low countries, yeah. yeah, that's where they ended up. Okay, so the spymaster's job was just to nab it and deadheaded at the right moment when the heads are ready to be lopped off but not before not when it's too late and the lesson seems to me is you can well one of the lessons is that you can't appease fanatics you you have to just deal with them yeah you have to cut them out it's as simple as that they're not there to reason with they are there to commit an act of violence it was quite interesting when you look back at the MV Nisha, that incident on the tramp steamer bringing sugar to London in 2001, that the special forces were pretty annoyed that the politicians were going, can you do it in daylight, not at night? 
because even potential terrorists have rights. No. Uh, yeah. Oh, I, I thought they wanted to, so they could put it on the TV. And... I, I'm sure there was part of that, but it was also a night raid might be too violent. Oh, <laughs> and uh, yes. so you're always getting political interference. You're always getting the politicians going, ooh, maybe this wouldn't play well with the media. Maybe social media might get hold of it today. You know, that sort of thing. And we need to appease our various interest groups or our voter base. Then, as now, you get the possibility of going off on a wild goose chase of getting a fragment of intelligence and misinterpreting it or running with it when you shouldn't. And a great modern example of that is 1969 when men from D Squadron SAS went to Northern Ireland on a training exercise and they were keeping the Belfast docks under surveillance to see what was coming in and whether arms being provided to the IRA. And there was a signals intercept that showed that an Argentinian ship was coming in carrying pistolos. There was great alarm because they thought, wow, this could be small arms being supplied to the IRA. So the SAS guys went out in their Gemini dinghies, boarded the ship, uh, locked down everyone on board, had them under their trained weapons, and discovered that pistoles was actually an Argentine term for sides of beef. So, again, this is how intelligence can go wrong or be misinterpreted. Cecil had to be sure that he wasn't getting the wrong end of the stick, that he wasn't painting the wrong picture. The only person he was answerable to was King James I. And James was wise enough to know that a spectacular crackdown against the Catholics would not help his cause. And actually, because it was pretty well handled after the gunpowder plotters were rounded up, there wasn't a sort of backlash, there wasn't a surge of support for the plotters. There was certainly a surge of support for the king. And in, in effect, it embedded him and reinforced his position. Yes. And people were very grateful that he had survived. And it's why, to this day, we have Bonfire Night. Jamie, as a postscript to our Gunpowder podcast, there are a couple of things I'd like to ask you uh, about. One is William Shakespeare, and the other is Princess Elizabeth, the Winter Queen. Well, let's deal with Shakespeare first. Uh, I suppose the big question is, did he know the plotters? And certainly when I wrote Treason, I had him play quite a large part in it. And there was a reason for that. He would almost certainly have known the plotters. He was a local boy made good. He bought new place, his house in Stratford towards the late 1590s. And he was a man of substance. He certainly would have known the Throckmortons who owned Cowton Court and most of the gentry in the area. And his daughters married into gentry. So coming to London, he probably would have hung out with them. He would have known the person who owned the Mermaid Tavern in which Shakespeare drank. What's interesting is that his great friend, Ben Johnson, was arrested after the gunpowder plot because he had actually turned up at one of the plotters' parties, pre-explosion parties. Uh, that were held. So Ben Jonson was certainly caught up in it. Shakespeare seemed to have kept his nose clean. It's always fascinated me that there's so few Christian references in his plays. And he walked a very difficult path, trod a difficult line. Don't forget he was also a king's man. He led the troupe of players who performed pl his plays in front of the court. Well, I see you start your book, Treason, about the gunpowder plot, with a quote from King Lear, so I'll just read that out now. These late eclipses in the sun and moon portend no good to us in cities, mutinies, in countries, discord, in palaces, treason. The bond crack twixt sun and father, King Lear, William Shakespeare. And it's interesting to note that there was a double eclipse in 1605, and many people thought that was a portent, that things would turn bad. And so they did, and the gunpowder plot appeared. And if you look at Lear, what is it about? It's, to me, a warning to a potential tyrant 
who only listens to those who flatter him, his evil daughters, and who banish those who tell him the truth, who tell truth to power. And maybe, just maybe, Shakespeare was putting a warning shot across the bows of the king. The warning shot being, don't be too tough on the Catholics. Don't be too tough to anybody and listen to reason. Be a good ruler. Do it right. Shakespeare would have been very aware of what was going on. And many people have commented that perhaps he was a crypto-Catholic. Perhaps his leanings were towards the old faith, not the Protestantism of James. Again, as I said, he kept Christianity out of his plays on the whole and certainly kept it out of King Lear. And then there was Princess Elizabeth. Uh, She had an interesting life because she ended up marrying King Frederick V of Bohemia and she was called the Winter Queen because she only lasted one winter or he only lasted one winter. So she was exiled and she ended up back in London and died in 6062 after the restoration of Charles II. So her time was rather tragic in a way. She didn't fulfill what she wanted to fulfill. But what fascinates me is what happened to her offspring, her descendants. Her son, Rupert, Prince Rupert of the Rhine, ended up as the flamboyant 23-year-old cavalry commander of the English Civil War, also ended up as a naval commander later on. And her grandson was none other than King George I. So in a way, she lived on through the royal family and her bloodline reaches all the way down the centuries to our queen today. Hmm. Very good. Well, dark deeds and mayhem. Thank you, James, for your excellent and entertaining thoughts on why the gunpowder plot was the original terrorist event. Yeah, it's certainly the original potential spectacular. Well, thank you. Thanks, Tom. So it goes. My name is Tom Ashton. His name is James Jackson. You can view images relating to each podcast on our Bloody Violent History Instagram account and on our website, bloodyviolenthistory.com. Please subscribe, it's free, to our podcast on the app you use and to our mailing list via our website. This is very important as it boosts our rankings in the podcast charts. Thank you and good luck. Thank you.